The Wild West conjures a lot of very specific mental images. It was a time of cowboys and bandits where laws didn't matter. All that mattered was who could draw their gun the fastest. There were cattle everywhere, people desperately searching for gold, and more train robberies than you can shake a derringer at. Those are all the tropes that we've been led to believe from movies, but the reality was not only a lot different, in many cases it was pretty bizarre when it compared to the popular myths. From the truth about gun violence and cowboy hats to the 60-year adventure of a corpse, today we're going to look at some of the weirder things that you didn't know about the Wild West. The Wild West is synonymous in most people's minds with gun violence. There were duels, shootouts between outlaws and deputies, and poker cheats getting shot in every saloon. That's how it was always portrayed in movies, so of course it must be true. And look, to some extent it was true, especially in the early years of the Wild West. But as towns sought to attract new residents and visitors, public safety and the curbing of this violence became a pretty key issue. As a result, the Wild West had some of the strictest gun control laws the United States has ever seen. Nearly everybody in the Wild West had a gun. And with good reason. There were armed bandits, wild animals, and Native Americans who strangely refused to embrace the settlers' cries of manifest destiny. It was a dangerous place, full of rowdy people, and authorities eventually decided that those people needed to be kept in line. They recognized that the best way to prevent violent crimes in their town was, well, to take away everybody's guns. Temporarily, at least. Gun control in the Wild West was treated like an early coat check system. Anyone who walked into the town would have to surrender their guns, knives, or any other weapons at the sheriff's office or hotel, and they would be given a token that they could use to claim their weapons when they departed. If someone was a known resident of the town, particularly if they were friends with law enforcement, they would be allowed to keep their guns for protection, but those guns had to remain at their homes. There was no carrying of weapons, open or concealed allowed, in many frontier towns. This wasn't some obscure experiment in a select few towns either. Towns like Tombstone, Deadwood, and Dodge City all enacted this form of gun control. The famous shootout at the OK Corral even began as a direct result of the Earp brothers and Doc Holliday attempting to enforce the town's prohibition against carrying firearms. And although it is often depicted as an epic confrontation in movies, that gunfight, well, it lasted all of 30 seconds. Though somewhat famous in the Wild West, these laws hadn't actually started there. Regulation on firearms had begun in southern states, and they were rarely challenged. When citizens did occasionally try to fight the bans on constitutional grounds, the laws were almost universally upheld. An 1840 ruling out of the state of Alabama stated that while the Constitution did guarantee the right to bear arms, it was not the right to bear arms upon all occasions and in all places. As for the Wild West specifically, there were few challenges to the gun control laws enacted. People may have grumbled and been annoyed about it, but a peaceful town was just better for everybody. Besides, the lawmen had better guns than most citizens did, and they were more than happy to use them, so the rare instances where people tried to protest the Wild West laws by keeping their guns on them in town usually ended up in that person being killed. When the 2011 movie Cowboys and Aliens was released, it was viewed by many as a silly but fun romp. It took two classic genres that had nothing to do with one another and mashed them together into something that was at least intended to be entertaining. But since UFO sightings didn't become particularly common until the end of World War II, surely these two things are not really connected. Right? Well, as it turns out, there actually were sightings of UFOs and even aliens throughout the Wild West. One of the most well-known sightings occurred in Lodi, California in 1896. A Civil War veteran and journalist named H.G. Shaw and one of his friends had an encounter with aliens, which he then wrote about in the local paper. The aliens reportedly were seven feet tall and very slender, with small hands, fingers without nails, and feet twice as long as normal and functions similar to a monkey's feet. These extraterrestrials were claimed to be Martians who had come to Earth to obtain a specimen and bring back to their home planet, also known as alien abduction. Of course, this story is obviously bullshit. Maybe it was a slow news day and Shaw needed to fill his column with literally anything. Maybe he was just having a laugh, or maybe he was testing out his fiction writing skills before submitting works to the newly created pulp magazine genre. But Shaw's actual intentions didn't really matter, as this news report started a chain reaction of similar reports of cigar-shaped UFOs across the United States that lasted for months. And a few months after Shaw's report was published came perhaps the single most famous Wild West alien encounter, the Aurora, Texas Incident. It was April the 17th, 1897, when the alien spacecraft crash-landed on a farm in Aurora after colliding with a windmill on the property of Judge J.S. Proctor. 
The incident was detailed two days later in the Dallas Morning News, though the paper didn't seem particularly interested. They ran a blurb that was about 250 words long, under the title of A Windmill Demolishes It. That was instead of making it front page news with a headline mentioning extraterrestrials. Life before clickbait. According to the reporting, the ship, which was claimed to be the same mystery airship allegedly seen by thousands of people across the United States in the preceding months, was flying abnormally low, likely due to technical issues. It hit the windmill, crashed, and the pilot was dead on impact. The residents of Aurora gave the alien, who they believed to be a Martian, a Christian burial in the local cemetery, and the remnants of the spaceship were tossed down the well on Judge Proctor's property. It's unclear whether or not the residents of Aurora actually believed the story that was reported, but they certainly embraced it since the town could certainly use the additional revenue from tourists. Of course, if they wanted to attract alien enthusiasts, they probably shouldn't have claimed to bury all of the evidence. But then again, there probably was no evidence. So, uh, yeah, money talks. When we think of the Wild West, few things are as iconic as the cowboy hat. However, the famous 10-gallon hats that are so synonymous with the Old West weren't actually worn there. Those hats didn't become popular until the 1920s, largely as a result of the Western movie genre. Though hats were quite popular, in the early years of the Wild West, people just wore whatever hats they happened to own already. These hats could have been straw, silk, fur, or wool, and in general, they were pretty terrible for the climate of the American West. They would be too hot in the summer and too cold in the winter, and in the event of rain, they'd stay wet for hours. Trying to combat these problems, in 1865, John Stetson created a new hat just for the Wild West that he called the Boss of the Plains. Stetson specifically designed these hats for the climate, making it the ideal hat. The hats were made from beaver felts, which made them waterproof, and they had a high rounded crown to provide insulation, and there was a flat, stiff brim to protect the wearer's head and neck from both sun and rain. Overall, they looked much more like a traditional Amish hat than anything resembling the iconic cowboy hats from the movies. Because the hats were waterproof and had an inner lining on the crown, in a pinch they could even be used as a container for water. Early advertisements for The Boss of the Plains featured a cowboy using his hat to provide water for his horse. It was the perfect hat for cowboys, but it also wasn't cheap. Even though Stetson was only making one model of hat, he sold them at a range of prices depending on the quality of the materials used. A Boss of the Plains hat would start at $5 and run all the way up to $30 for pure beaver felt. That's about $95 to $570 today, which is a lot more than most cowboys were willing to spend on a hat. Instead, it was actually the bowler, also known as the derby, that was the most popular hat in the Wild West. Though they didn't offer as much protection against the elements as Stetsons, they still provided some protection, were extremely durable, were less likely to get blown off in high winds than larger brimmed hats, and most importantly, they were a whole lot cheaper. Though Stetson's Boss of the Plains did become more popular in the late 1800s, they were more of a status symbol than the typical headwear for your average cowboy. The iconic cowboy hats that we're familiar with are largely modeled on older, beat-up Boss of the Plains hats. Over time, the crown would become dented and the once stiff brim would become curved making them somewhat resemble the more modern 10-gallon hats. Before the West could be won, first, people needed to actually travel out West. For most people, this immediately conjures images of caravans of covered wagons traveling for months along the Oregon Trail. Not only has this journey been immortalized by the incredibly popular 1982 educational video game The Oregon Trail, but it just makes sense. The shortest route from the eastern United States to the Wild West would be to travel by land. So it's the thing that makes the most intuitive sense. However, many early settlers actually traveled by boat rather than by wagon. In the early days of the California Gold Rush, Trails heading that far west weren't well established. It was also an extremely long and treacherous journey, with the trail from Missouri to Oregon taking four to five months. Making it all the way to California would take even longer. For early settlers, especially those starting on the east coast rather than in Missouri, there was a better solution. Why travel 3,000 miles to get to California when you could just travel 17,000 miles to get there instead? Of course, that 17,000 miles was traveled by boat, so the entire journey usually took about five months. Especially for those on the east coast, this was much faster than traveling by land, but it was hardly an easy journey. Ships would set sail from the eastern United States and have to travel all the way around South America in order to reach California. This took the ships through Cape Horn, often regarded as the most dangerous passage in the world for ships. There were shorter routes available through the Isthmus of Panama or the Strait of Magellan, but those were even more perilous journeys. In total, about 40,000 people arrived in California by boat rather than by traversing the Oregon Trail, most of them settling in San Francisco. More might have been willing to come using the sea route, but 
Many of these ships didn't make the journey more than once. It was the gold rush, after all, so there was more money to be made striking gold than sailing a ship. Many of the ships that made it to San Francisco were abandoned, with crews fleeing the ships to go and work in the mines. Because people were arriving in San Francisco far faster than houses could actually be built, these abandoned ships were often turned into temporary lodging for new settlers. Elmer McCurdy was born in Washington, Maine in 1880. His mother wasn't married, so Elmer was adopted by his aunt and uncle to spare his mother the stigma of raising an illegitimate child. When Elmer was 10 years old, his adopted father died of tuberculosis, so his aunt and birth mother moved with him to Bangor in Maine. He was eventually told the truth about his birth mother, which led to him becoming an alcoholic by the time he was a teenager. This bad habit made it impossible for Elmer to hold down a job, and he traveled the eastern United States searching for work. After years of failure, he eventually made his way out west to Kansas, then Missouri. At the age of 27, Elmer joined the U.S. Army, serving four years until 1910. It was the final years of the Wild West, but Elmer only had one year left him in anyway. He had been trained by the Army in demolition using nitroglycerin, and he decided that he was going to use this knowledge to rob banks and trains since he couldn't maintain an honest job. Unfortunately, he wasn't trained particularly well in demolition. Elmer's first attempted robbery was of a train to Oklahoma that was carrying $4,000 in a safe in one of its cars. He and three associates were able to successfully stop the train, and Elmer used nitroglycerin to blow the safe door open, but he used entirely too much, destroying the safe entirely. Most of the money was destroyed in the explosion. The bandits escaped with only $450 in silver coins, most of which had partially melted and fused with the remnants of the safe. Now, this wasn't a good start, but Elmer wasn't going to give up. His next attempt was a bank robbery in Kansas. After hammering through a wall to break into the bank, Elmer blew off the bank's outer vault door. It caused a lot of damage to the bank, but the safe inside the vault was unscathed. When Elmer tried to blow open the safe, the charge failed to detonate. At that point, the lookout got spooked so they ran away, managing to steal only $150 in coins from a bank till. Elmer's final attempt came in October 1911, when he heard a train running through Oklahoma would be carrying a $400,000 payment to the Assage Nation. It would have been a huge score, were it not for the fact that Elmer and his men mistakenly stopped a passenger train instead of their intended target. They escaped with only $46 and a couple of bottles of whiskey. A couple of days later, three deputies tracked Elmer to the ranch where he was staying. Elmer allegedly opened fire first, but either way, the deputies shot and killed him. Whiskey train robberies and deputies shooting criminals all sound pretty normal for how people think of the Wild West, but the weird part is what happened next. Elmer's body was taken to a funeral home where he was embalmed using arsenic, a standard practice at the time when there was no known next of kin and the body might be on display for a while. Nobody came to claim the body, but Joseph Johnson, the owner and undertaker of the funeral home, refused to bury it. He had spent time and money preparing the body, so he wasn't putting it in the ground until he got paid. In an effort to make his money back, Johnson put the body on display as an attraction. Capitalizing on the notoriety of the rather unsuccessful outlaw, Johnson invited customers to come and see The Bandit Who Wouldn't Give Up for the low price of one nickel each. It was a huge hit, and Johnson turned down multiple offers from carnivals that sought to purchase the corpse for themselves. It remained on display at the funeral home for five years until James and Charles Patterson of the Great Patterson Carnival Shows were able to claim the body by masquerading as Elmer's long-lost brothers. There were several different owners, but Elmer's body would spend the next 60 years touring the country on display in various carnival sideshows shows and wax museums. His life was far more interesting and profitable after his death, and the body wasn't finally buried until 1976. At the time, Elmer's corpse was hanging from the gallows of a spooky funhouse attraction in a California amusement park. The body was in pretty bad shape at this point, so it had been a few years since it was on display, and many had even forgotten about it. It wasn't until an episode of The Six Million Dollar Man was filming at the amusement park that the body was rediscovered. The prop master grabbed what he believed to be a mannequin, but an arm fell off, and he saw human bone and muscle tissue instead of wax or plastic. After being autopsied for the second time, Elmer's identity was confirmed, and he was finally given a burial. Thank you